the key to having a successful channel is being consistent and showing up. It's true for everyone on social media. It's a marathon. You have to keep showing up for it. And the way you're going to keep showing up and being authentic is that you're actually passionate about the topic and entertaining or educating people. Who are you? What is your channel about? How many subscribers do you have? Yeah, well, thanks again for having me. My name is Tom Walters. I uh, am a physical therapist. I have a doctorate in physical therapy, and my channel is called Rehab Science. It's focused all around um, teaching people, basically, mostly exercises and movements, um, teaching people how to self-manage the most common pains and injuries. I'm an orthopedic physical therapist. So it's all the common stuff that most of us get back pain, sciatica, plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow. So exercises for those conditions. And it, the channel is currently at 482,000 subscribers and uh, really grew a hundred thousand last month. So I've had some really recent big growth, which has been exciting. What inspired you to start your channel? Tell us about your first video. Yeah, you know, I have been on social media actually for a while and I started in 2016 on Instagram. So I have been doing the type of work I'm doing for quite a while. Uh, the YouTube channel, the inspiration for that really was a friend who's a YouTuber. And I had started my channel actually in 2017, but I didn't, I only posted one video that year. I really didn't do much. And uh, it is pretty funny to go back and watch those original videos. You know, I didn't have a microphone. The audio is horrible. The lighting, I didn't know a whole lot about what I was doing. You really can't hear me very well. There's a lot of echo. Um, you know, the content hasn't changed that much. I'd probably become more streamlined, but I really became more inspired to be consistent on YouTube because of seeing this friend. Uh, he started YouTube when I started Instagram and he was very consistent and uh, I just was able to see how it grew. And to be honest, you know, I started on social media as a hobby. It was kind of just to put out positive content. I was teaching at a college here in town and I really wanted to try and debunk some of the harmful myths that I'd hear patients come into the clinic with. And I also had, you know, I'd been a physical therapist for 10 years when I started my channel. So I just knew what the common kind of patterns and conditions were. And I knew there was a lot people could do on their own with exercise. So I wanted to teach some of that. And, uh, you know, as my Instagram channel grew, it was taking up time. And I thought, you know, I should try and make this more of a business and actually make some money from what all this time I'm putting in. And YouTube really became a natural choice because it's just really, I think, the best platform for monetization and being able to make some money on the free content you're putting out. So not only did I, I wanted to help people on another platform, but it was also nice that you could also um, generate some income from it. What strategies did you use to grow your subscriber count from zero to a thousand? What about from a thousand to where you are now? Yeah, I would say, you know, um, strategy wise, a lot of it for me was watching videos from other YouTubers, Think Media and some of these other channels that kind of coach creators on uh, just creating better content. So I think that I evolved early on in terms of just small changes uh, in terms of making my content better. I got a microphone. Um, you know, I didn't have a microphone at first. I just uh, learned more about lighting, you know, and um, still it's not like it's perfect. I, a lot of times just using natural lighting through a window, I have good windows around. So um I think I learned about lighting and audio. I also, that was probably the biggest things in the beginning. I, I tried to, I knew thumbnails were important. And uh, so in the beginning, I was creating my own thumbnails. And so I was working on that, trying to make those better. And that really was when the channel was real small, probably in that first thousand, really up till probably 10,000 subscribers. I was kind of I was kind of functioning in that early sort of way. And then I met, I had a, weekend together with my friend who's a full-time YouTuber. And I really learned a lot from him, different strategies and really sort of how important thumbnails are, how important titles are, uh, just optimizing videos, the lighting and audio. So I, at that point, I really implemented a few other just small things that are, I think, easy for most people to implement, you know, just getting, I just, I spent $250, I think on a Rode wireless microphone. So 
that made a huge difference in my audio. I mean, that was probably the biggest in terms of the content. I just thought a little more about my lighting, uh, ordered some lights. I don't use them a ton, but I thought a little more about that. And then I actually started working with a guy on Fiverr who makes my thumbnails. You know, it's like $5 a thumbnail. So I have someone on Fiverr. He's actually in Ukraine and makes my thumbnails. And, uh, and then I started using a uh, program called TubeBuddy that helps you optimize your titles and content and gives you kind of a SEO score um, for your YouTube content. It looks at how much competition is there for what you're talking about, how good is your title based on that competition. And that TubeBuddy has really been helpful as I create each video. And I think that has helped my videos um, help people find them and just to get the views up. So those are some of the things that came probably after 10,000 subscribers after I met with him and that I still use to this day. I'll say, you know what, the one other strategy that's been more recent that's really helped me are shorts, YouTube shorts. And I saw this, you know, I was lucky that I was on Instagram early. I was probably one of the first five physical therapists posting on Instagram, posting physical therapy content. And I so I sort of went through that wave of reels, you know, how big reels were on Instagram. And then when YouTube brought those into shorts, I had a whole video library of reels that I just brought over and started putting on YouTube. Just thinking, I just, at the time, I just thought I just have this content, I'll put it up here. And uh, those have become, you know, I think for anyone who's a smaller creator right now, try to make engaging shorts because, you know, I grew 100,000 subscribers this last month, last month, basically from one short that got 30 million views. So it, those shorts can be really powerful if you can get a good angle or find something engaging. You know, um, I do a lot of manual therapy ones where my wife's a physical therapist too, but I will be working on her and sort of filming just that region of the body. So it's engaging to people because it's like, oh, what's this? I kind of see this shoulder here and he's pushing on it. And those videos always do really well. So whatever your content is or your industry, I think you try to figure out a way to make engaging shorts. And that can be a great way. Um, I just talked to a, another creator who he gained 2 million subscribers in one year, made both mostly from shorts. How important are thumbnails and video tiles? How do you decide on these? I do think they are important. You know, when I look at my analytics, most people are finding me on kind of their homepage. They'll see a video, you know, um, and I think I know from they'll see it in that that kind of what do they call it on YouTube, like the homepage where you see all the different videos that come up, sort of like the search page. Um, so I have a lot of people find me there and then and the actual YouTube search. And I think both of those things, if you're on the homepage, just kind of scrolling a thumbnail that's not too busy and gets right to the point and helps the person understand, especially my content is very educational. So something that helps the person understand just really quickly, what is this about? And is it something that's going to help me? So I do think the thumbnail being kind of simple, I try not to put more than three pieces of information on the thumbnail. So usually it's kind of like a picture of me and then like an anatomy picture and then the title. And it kind of shows like, I'm doing a movement in it. It's like pointing towards this type, this part of anatomy, and then it's the title. And I, uh, and then I use that TubeBuddy program to determine what that title should be by doing different keyword searches and figuring out, okay, what's the thing that most people are searching for, but isn't, there aren't many creators creating, using this exact title to talk about that topic. And so it gives you a score, you know, from zero to hundred percent on how good that title is. And I do really think because most people who are coming to my channel right now, are, the number one thing they're coming from is shorts. So shorts are, are huge. But after that, it's the YouTube kind of homepage and the YouTube search. And I think those two things both have to do with the thumbnail and the title. And so I do think they're really important. Um, you know, just I know for me, when I'm on that homepage, if somebody has a really engaging thumbnail, maybe it's a face of someone famous you recognize or or it's a title, you know, there's so many good videos out there on titles. It's such a, there's so much psychology to it. And I think when you see a good title, you don't even think about it, but it, it hooks you. And there's a lot of thought, I think that you need to put into coming up with good titles. And for me, it's probably a little bit easier because it's educational. And I'm talking about something very specific. I tend to find with my content that if I, if the title includes a very a real problem area for someone like plantar fasciitis, or it's usually a diagnosis in my field, like tennis elbow or sciatica. It's like, 
I have to include that word and then just manipulate a few other words so that it pops up in the search for people. But I, I do think those two things are still really important. Were there any specific videos or moments that significantly boosted your channel's popularity? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was, uh, like I said, I, I technically started my YouTube channel in 2017, but it wasn't until COVID that I decided to kind of start posting a few more videos. And I remember in 2020, I was actually at my mother-in-law's house and I filmed an ankle sprain rehab video in her bedroom. You know, it's not a great location for a rehab video, but I did luckily have a microphone at that point and I filmed this five exercises for an ankle sprain. And I think in 2020, I only posted three videos, but I remember in 2021 was when I really decided to be more consistent. I had met with my friend who was the YouTuber. I decided I was going to like really post once a week and get serious about this. I remember I, I hadn't logged in. I hadn't even checked my YouTube account in probably six to eight months. So I posted that video in 2020. I come back in 2021 and I see that that ankle sprain video has 600,000 views and has gotten my channel to the point where now it can make money. So it was, it blew my mind. Uh, first, I talked to my friend who, you know, sometimes when you see, I saw that it was possible how well his channel was doing and he was making good money from it. And and then I thought, and then I saw that video and I was like, oh my goodness, there's really something here. I just need to do this more regularly. And basically, I knew that that content was engaging on other platforms because I'd been on Instagram for so long. So I thought, I just need to do this over here. It'll just be a little bit longer form and cover the same topics. I already have kind of an idea of what engages people around this type of material. And so that was really the thing that blew me away was this ankle sprain video. And it's still, it's my number two or three video right now. I think it has 1.6 million views. So, and it's just, it's, you know, I go back and look at it. And it's a little embarrassing because it's not, it's not in a good location. It's, it just, there's a lot of things that Kirsten and I, Kirsten, and my wife, it does all my videography and we just, we were, didn't know what we were doing really back then. So it's just funny that it's one of my top videos. What is your monetization strategy? My YouTube channel, the only monetization on it is just what's built into YouTube, you know, so just turning on Google AdSense and letting, you know, all the ads people see at the beginning and partway through videos. I don't at this point, I am very picky and not wanting to do promotions. I don't, I try to be very evidence-based and science-based in my approach to rehab. And there are a lot of just kind of, there are a lot of product companies that approach me like, Hey, we've got the best pillow for neck pain. And I just, I'm not really interested in going down that road. And I don't want to feel like a sellout. I think my audience I know on Instagram appreciates that kind of scientific approach and the evidence and not just promoting everything under the sun. So I am pretty resistant to it. You know, I mean, I have done things in the past, but it's usually things that I really believe in and I would use myself. And it really has probably only been three different things in the six or seven years I've been on social media. So really my strategy on YouTube is just the built-in monetization. What do you believe is the key to building a loyal and engaged subscriber base? I think uh, one of the major keys is to try to be, if you are a person, I think you have to think about, is my channel educational or entertainment based? And those are the two branches you hear about most often. And I think I can speak mostly from the education side because that's, really what I do. But I think that from an education standpoint, the comments that I see most often about that, I one of the comments I see most often on my videos is that people appreciate that the thumbnail and title actually aligns with what the video is about and that it's concise to the point. And I'm not just spending extra time trying to get longer videos. It's my videos range from five to eight minutes and it's really the amount of time I need to explain the four or five exercises and why people are doing them. And I think people, I hear that often, you know, I appreciate that your videos are clear and concise. Don't waste a lot of time. They get straight to the point. And I think again, that the content in the video matches up. I'm not just trying to, I'm not trying to create click baity titles just to get someone to click on something. The title and the thumbnail is actually reflective of what's in the video. And I think if you do that consistently, your audience will trust you, you know, and, you know, I, I, and, you know, I think sometimes my videos, also, if you're in your videos, that can 
be easier, I think, too, because I noticed on Instagram, I would share lots of different things. And probably a third of the time I'd be in my video or my post. And it took a while. You know, my audience didn't always know who this Tom Walters guy was on Instagram, whereas YouTube, it has been a little easier to build trust, I think, with the audience because I'm in every video. And so people know this rehab science guy, this is him. He's in every video. So not everybody is in their videos, but that I think can also just naturally help kind of build trust too. If your mission is to entertain or educate people and you stay true to that, then your authenticity will come through. That original mission and vision will come through. I know in the years that I've been on social media, if I ever start to let other motivations creep in and become primary, like making money or something, then the content will become, I think you can see through it. It, it The content is, the quality goes down a little bit. And I think it comes off as less, you know, you can tell when somebody's kind of salesy and schmoozy, it, it's not authentic. And so I do think you have to really go into this. My nine-year-old daughter was just talking to me. She wants to start a YouTube channel. And I was trying to have this talk with her about, you have to, you know, because people so often are talking about these channels as a way to make money, but you can't go into it with that mindset. You have to go into it with you really are passionate about the topic and the content and enjoy making videos because you'll never. The key to having a successful channel is being consistent and showing up. It's true for everyone on social media. It's a marathon. You have to keep showing up for it. And the way you're going to keep showing up and being authentic is that you're actually passionate about the topic and entertaining or educating people. How do you handle criticism and negative comments on your videos? That is a tricky thing to navigate. You know, you're right. I don't get the vast majority of the comments I get are positive. I rarely get something negative. And so for me, I do reply to a lot of comments. That has been one of the strategies. And that's another strategy maybe to mention for growing a channel. People really appreciate if you're in, I don't know about entertainment, but education, if you respond to comments, that was one of the main strategies that grew my Instagram channel. And it has been for my YouTube channel. I have a lot of people respond saying, you know, I can't believe you respond to comments. This is why I'm subscribing. So, but there is a danger in that, that, you know, negative comments can really affect how you feel and you have to kind of develop um, a little bit of, I think, for me, I when I see negative comments, if they're clearly just negative to be negative, I just try to, I'll delete them sometimes just to not have them on there. Or if it's something really disrespectful, I do block people sometimes if it's just blatantly disrespectful. If somebody has a negative criticism, though, that is about something in the video, you know, I'd take that stuff in and think about it. I mean, I've had on rare occasions had other physios say, hey, I don't think you should you know, we don't, you know, I don't think it, this should be the title or I don't think you should use that language anymore, that term, or why are you doing this exercise? And there have been times where I've changed. You know, I just did a post the other day on a hand condition, a finger condition. And, and there are physios who specialize only in the hand and I'm not one of those. And I had a hand physio say, I wouldn't do that extra, one of the exercises. And I made a note of that. I was like, I won't include that exercise next time around. That person is a specialist in the hand. So I do try to, <clears throat> criticism is hard sometimes, but actual good, respectful criticism, I will take it in and um, make changes. So I think as a person in a science field, you have to do that. Otherwise you just become outdated and people see through that. They see that kind of ego and uh, inflexibility. Can you share a memorable fan interaction with us? Yeah, I'm lucky and fortunate that it's amazing. I have a lot of comments on the stuff that I put in my videos helping people. And that is one of the biggest motivators for me to keep going. It's unbelievable to, because obviously physical therapy exercises on a so video or a post is not the same as someone coming to see me and me working on them and prescribing something really specific. So the fact that these videos can help people is unbelievable. And 25% of my subscribers are in India where they often don't have access to physio. They don't have access to it. So for them to have a device and be able to watch videos and get better is, is the coolest thing. And I have comments every day of people saying, oh my goodness, like one of the videos that gets probably the most is a video I have on arm nerve pain on uh, 
just nerve pain in the arm and it's different nerve mobilization exercises. And that video gets so many comments of someone saying, I've had nerve pain for such and such time. And I did these exercises today and it's already getting better. It's like, it went away. I mean, that video probably gets the most, uh, of any video, but that is a common thing where someone has something and they do the exercises and they have some improvement in their symptoms and their function in their life. And I think those are, that's probably my favorite kind of interaction um, with people on my channel. And, and like I say, really one of the biggest motivators for me to keep going. What advice do you have for creators who want to grow their YouTube channels? Well, I think it's things that get talked a lot, of, a lot about on uh, in this kind of idea of creating a channel. Um, if people watch any videos anywhere else, I think they will have heard these types of messages, but they're so true. And I think it is the being authentic piece we talked about before, like just be yourself. Um, because if you aren't being yourself, you'll burn out and you won't keep doing it. And so I think you have to be yourself. I think you have to really pick a topic area that you feel passionate about, whether that's helping people or you're just interested in it. Um, because those two things, be, being authentic and finding a, an area that you're really passionate about will lead to the third, which is consistency. And consistency is so huge. You just have to keep showing up. You know, I've seen some other big YouTubers, um, you know, talk about just try to post one to two videos a week for the next three years and things will grow, you know, but you have to, you have to go into it with that mindset. And if you're really going to be able to stick with something for that long, you have to reduce the friction associated with it. And I think, you know, some of that reducing that friction will just be being yourself and covering an area that you're actually interested in. Um, you know, and of course there's other things like don't make, maybe start out with videos that aren't as complicated and just know that you'll evolve over time, but maybe start out with things that are easier for you to get going. Cause you just need to get going. So many people overthink trying to be perfect and the perfect amount of editing and they compare their, the look at videos of creators who have been around for a while and try to want to emulate that or create at that level and I think you might get there but just be okay with where you're starting and know almost every creator you ever hear of evolved quite a bit and if you go back and look at their first videos it's a pretty big difference so and there is something to be said for videos that are a little more simple I think they seem oftentimes more authentic and uh you know if you start with really complicated fancy videos you sort of have to stay with that because your audience gets used to it so, you know, I think in terms of getting going and being successful, just be yourself, be authentic, go with a topic that you're actually passionate about, be consistent and, you know, try to reduce friction in the beginning so you actually can get going. <laughs>